Thank you very much, uh, Monica and Jessica. Can you hear me? That's okay. Oh, good. They're coming in. <laughs> All right, I'm going to cover a lot of ground. And uh, it's not ground that you're taught, whether you're in business or political science or chemical engineering. There are a couple of chemical engineering students here. And what happens when we all grow up corporate, and we all grow up corporate, this is a corporate-dominated society. Uh, you know, by the time we're 20 years old, we've seen tens of thousands of advertisements that provide the image of the marketplace. For example, I saw thousands of advertisements when I was your age for cars. I never saw a single ad on television for public transit. But there were cars, and they had fins and hood ornaments, and they were death traps. Uh, there weren't seat belts, there weren't airbags, there weren't padded dash panels. And I lost a lot of friends in car crashes, or they were disabled for life in high school and college. And I began wondering why the driver was blamed for everything. They called the driver the net, nut behind the wheel. And I realized that there is a, a very controlling process operating here, namely that the auto companies didn't want attention directed to their unsafe automobile design, and the highway designers certainly didn't want it, so they blamed the driver. Even though anybody who knows anything about human factors knows that they're all related, driver, vehicle, highway. Here in Los Angeles in particular, uh, back uh, in the 1930s, uh, the auto company's main challenger were the, was the trolley business. And they made sure that they conspired, literally, with an oil company and a tire company and General Motors, and they bought up 28 metropolitan trolley systems all over the world, including the biggest one in the world, all over the country. The biggest one in the country was in Southern California, tore up the tracks, and then went to Sacramento pushing for more highways because it's the way they, they sold more vehicles, tires, gasoline. And that's affecting you right now. How many of you have been in congested highway situations, right? So there's no, <laughs> I was just kidding because you don't, if you haven't, you haven't lived here, right? But you see, that's not on your mind. I don't know how many of you even know about it, but the three companies led by General Motors were criminally prosecuted by the U.S. Justice Department right after World War II, successfully. But look what the penalty was. The judge fined General Motors for what is arguably the crime of the century, economic crime of the century, because look what it did to our whole transportation system, $5,000. That was the fine. No one went to jail, even though it was a criminal violation of the antitrust law. How many of you ever heard that situation? Yeah, even though it was on 60 Minutes years ago. We don't grow up learning about these things. Well, I grew up and I lost, I lost friends on the highway. And I began looking into this. And I realized that it wasn't just the driver. It was the, uh, the, the vehicle that didn't protect you in a crash. Now, if you're in a crash, you immediately use the seatbelt and the airbag to help you from going through a windshield. I mean, this stuff was known decades ago. The Roman chariots in ancient Rome, they had padded uh, fronts on their chariots in case, you know, they bumped. There's nothing new about this. But we didn't decide how safe cars are going to be. A few executives in Detroit did. And they decided they were going to cut the fine lines, so they're going to pour a lot of money on horsepower, speed, style, and underestimate safety and underemphasize safety and, and do very little about pollution. There are people in Southern California 40 years ago going around, smog was horrible. And the auto companies denied that it had anything to do with motor vehicles, trucks, and buses. Until an engineering professor at Caltech, Arlie Hagen Schmidt, proved the connection between auto emissions and photochemical smog. And we used that in Washington, D.C. and in Sacramento. And civic activists in your, this part of the woods used it to start the first pollution control 
regulations. So that now, I mean, you may think it's not very clean air, but talk to your parents or see what it was really like in those days. I mean, they used to have ads on television in Los Angeles for murine. Murine was something you put in your eye. Here's what the ad was. Buy urine for smog-ridden eyes. So that's how bad it was. Now, I have to persuade you a couple things. Number one, we all see just a tiny bit of reality. That's the nature of this complex world. But if we grow up corporate, we see even a less bit of reality. We don't see how corporations affect us. Corporations and corporate power, they're not part of the presidential campaign. You saw that debate. Anybody talk about corporate crime? Which the Wall Street Journal reports all the time is a corporate crime wave, you know, from Wall Street to Houston. Commercial crime, ripoffs, banks, insurance companies, violation of toxic uh, control standards, uh, violation of labor laws. It's all over, but it's off the table. You see them talk about single payer, full Medicare for all, everybody in, nobody out, free choice of doctor and hospital. Majority of the people want that. Majority of nurses and doctors want that. Doesn't matter. The two politicians running for the White House never talk about it. Green Party does. One area after another is just off the charts. It's not in front of our consciousness, even though you don't take a single breath in 24 hours without being affected by corporations. Look at your credit cards, your debit cards, your gadgets, your TV. Look at the food you eat. Look at the air you breathe. Look at the water you drink. Look at the uh, infant formula replacing mother's milk. That was a spectacular marketing victory uh, for corporations years ago, instilling fear in, in women. Look at uh, the choice of of transportation systems. Look what you have to do to get around here on the ground. Look at the poverty. Look at the horrendous poverty. Half the people in this country are poor. That is, half of the households, uh, may, say two, three, four people, parents, two children, under $40,000. That's not considered poor. A four-member family making under $40,000 is not considered poor. The official definition of poverty by the Department of Labor, if you, make, if you have a family of four and you make $23,000 total before deductions, you are not considered poor. If you make $22,000, you are. That's the cutoff, right between twenty-two dollars and twenty-three. dollars Now, there, there are ways to start waking up about this. I got pretty angry at the auto companies, and I wasn't much older than you, but I had saturated myself with the engineering deficiencies of motor vehicles and how long the engineers had developed seat belts and airbags and better tires, better brakes, et cetera, but they weren't being put in the cars. That wasn't, that wasn't the priority of the auto executives in Detroit. And so I went to Washington, and I uh, make a long story short, uh, General Motors hired detectives to try to stop me, and they tried to follow me everywhere to get dirt on me. They used nice young women to compromise me, uh, trap me, anything. And it was all exposed. And at the, in the U.S. Senate, there was a big hearing in uh, March 1966, and fortunately, it completely boomeranged on GM. The president of GM had to come and apologize, and we got the motor vehicle safety and highway safety laws through, signed by Lyndon Johnson in September 1966. That's how fast things moved then. We've been waiting for full health insurance coverage since Harry Truman proposed it in the 1940s, and we still don't have it. And in case you think this is just an economic issue, 800 Americans die every week because they can't afford health insurance uh, to get diagnosed and treated. Who says so? Anybody who makes an assertion at this podium, when you come to lectures, you always try to ask two questions. What's your evidence? 
And what's the legal authority when they talk about foreign and military policy and drones and you know, invading anybody, any, any area we want, killing anybody we want? What's your evidence? What is your legal authority constitutionally, statutorily? So my evidence on 800 a week is a peer-reviewed study by Harvard Medical School researchers that came out in the American Journal of Public Health in December 2009. That's 45,000 people a year who die because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. And you can imagine how many get sicker and get more injured because they can't afford health insurance to get treated. Now, nobody in Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Taiwan, Italy, Sweden die because they can't get health insurance. They're insured from the cradle to grave. So what, what's, what's the problem with the land of the free, home of the brave? What's wrong with us? You know, we won World War II. And you got all these Western European countries they're in little trouble now because they bought the U.S. Uh, financial Goldman Sachs credit mania uh, uh, model. But until they got into trouble, here's what they gave all their people that we do not have in this country for all our people. A higher minimum wage, four weeks paid vacation, universal health insurance, paid maternity leave, paid family sick leave, paid child care, inexpensive and quite ambitious public transit, stronger labor laws, support for the arts and for parks, and we don't have any of that here for all the people. Anyway, we won World War II. They had a multi-party system, we did not, so we didn't have small parties being able to leverage the dominant parties as they did in Western Europe. We didn't have the trade union strength that they had. And we certainly didn't have the large cooperatives, food co-ops, all kinds of co-ops they had, housing co-ops and so on. Working through those three, they essentially abolished poverty. How can you have poverty when you have all of these safety nets? Poverty as we know it in South Central LA and other places. Trouble is, we are, of course, exceptional, aren't we? The politicians lull us into an egomaniacal complacency by saying, America's number one. Are you kidding? America in 1980 was number one in wages. It's probably 25 in dropping, among other nations. America was the nation's leading creditor. They owed us. Now, we're by far the leading debtor in trade imbalances. 32 years straight of trade deficits, for example. America has more people in jail per capita than any country in the world, far more in China. We, have, we had 200,000 people in jail 40 years ago. We have 2.3 million now, many of nonviolent drug offenders. You know, they smoked the wheat. They had a few in reserve in their pocket. Yeah, we're number one in all those. Yeah. Number one. Number one in consumer indebtedness. Now, we've got to shake ourselves out of our complacency. I know what you're thinking. You know, you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. You've got your own personal problems, your own personal delights. You want to do well here at USC. You're looking to get a decent job in a shrinking job market, white collar, blue collar. There's a considerable anxiety and insecurity because of that. You have student debt, right? Don't you have student debt? A lot of you have student debt. And so that limits your expectation level of yourself. And you never want to do that. You must have a higher estimate of your own significance. First of all, you're going to be around a while. You got 15,000 days before you turn 65, a little over 2,000 weeks. Sounds like a lot, but it goes fast as you go into your 30s and 40s. So you want to get underway fast. For what? 
Well, how do you want to use your life? When you look back on your life, is it enough that you piled up money and you gave it to your children? Had a couple of houses, maybe? The real challenge is in your generation, you're not going to believe what they're going to be like unless you start now. How many of you know anything about nanotechnology? That's exploding. It has incredible consequences. It's decentralizing. Pretty soon it'll be students in high school working it. The technology is decentralized. There is no legal regulation of it. It's in 5,000 products, but it's nothing compared to what the potential is for invading your privacy, subjecting you to all kinds of controls. There are a lot of benefits to it. You know, they can direct the drug right to your particular tumor, they claim. But all these technologies that are tumultuous, the companies will tell you their benefits, genetic engineering, but they won't tell you the dark side. That we have to find out for ourselves. Prop 37 is the first step here on the ballot. It would be mandatory labeling of genetically engineered foods in the supermarket. If you win it, it'll spread across the country. Monsanto controls Washington on this issue, but they're not going to be able to control you, although they put $35 million into you. Now, I gave you this, uh, it's in your hands, right? Every, most everybody have this. You know why I gave you this? Because it's about when you were born. I put this on on a cold winter day in New Hampshire during the presidential primary. And take, take it home with you and go through it, and rest assured, I could have put this out today with very little difference. We have a paralyzed society when it comes to solutions. We have pretty good muckraking that we're living a golden age of book exposés and documentary exposés. There's a great one coming your way, if it isn't here already, the house I live in on drug policy and the war on drugs, produced by Eugene Jericki. Keep your eye out for that one. But the more we have, and they're coming out like 10 times more than when I was your age, exposing the steel, the copper, the oil, the insurance, the banking industry, what's going on in the third world with Western companies, and China, and surf labor in Indonesia, and supplying Apple, computer and so on. You've seen all this. And the more comes out, the less change. Why? Because as citizens, we've quit. We got other more important things to do than attend to our civic duties. Half of us don't vote in presidential elections. Most of us don't show up. Half of democracy showing up. Let me ask you right now, how many of you have never been at a Starbucks, Walmart, or a shopping wall, mall? You've never been? Are you from Siberia? <laughs> okay, one person. Not surprising. How many of you have never been to a city council meeting? See the hand? Don't be bashful. I want to make a point here. How many of you have never been to a court of law as a spectator? As a spectator. Okay. How many of you have never been to a prison or penitentiary as a visitor? Okay. Now, you see, in the, pro in the commercial sector, you're there. You want to buy things. No problem. But in the civic sector, you're not there. And a couple years ago, we interviewed some middle school kids from uh, Connecticut. They live in a town of 11,000 people. They never knew where the town hall is. They're living in virtual reality, looking at screens, video, television, computers, you know, smartphones, and whatever. 
And the average preteen now spends six to seven hours a day looking at screens. When you look at screens, you're out of reality. You're not connecting with your siblings, with your neighborhood, with adults in the community. You're not working on real things like connecting the classroom with the community. Here you had, due to Allison Dundee's rent-in, who's here, where's Allison? Yeah, you started a few years ago, I was here a few years ago, a course on civic skills and experience. Now there are almost no universities and community colleges in the country that have a course on civic skills and experience. It's your most important skill. You can know a lot of things about a few specialized subjects. You're all going to be specialized. But if you don't have civic skills, you're going to be going through life on your knees, taking whatever is dealt out to you, even if you make a good living. Look at climate change. Look at wars. Now, it's so bad that if I ask you, you do know how to write a thousand word essay on your athletic skills, plus or minus, thousand word essay on your social skills, thousand word essay on your academic skills. Can you write a thousand word essay on your civic skills? You know, I don't blame you. I, I went through the same process. It's ridiculous. You can teach people how to use the Freedom of Information Act in a matter of hours. The California and federal Freedom of Information Act to get files and documentations that are not available because the bureaucrats don't want to be affirmatively open. But we got through these laws and you can use them. By the way, anybody in the world can use them, even people we don't like. So please look at this. This is not online. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> look at this and ask, why does a society that has so many solutions on the shelf or in pilot projects, we got examples of the inner city school that really works, but it's not the majority. We got good transportation services for the elderly to get from A to B but it's not widespread. We got companies who treat their workers like paradise. Try Patagonia near Santa Barbara. Read the latest book out, The Responsible Company by Yvonne Chouinard. We've got companies that are moving toward 100% recycling and zero pollution who produce Carpet Tiles, the biggest company in the world, producing carpet tiles out of Atlanta, Georgia, with plants all over the world. Interface Corporation. But it's not spreading enough fast. So we have all these solutions, like we don't know how to provide nutritious food. We don't know how to decentralize our economy, so we don't have the strings pulled by some people in uh, New York or London or Chicago or destabilize us, hollow out our community, ship our industries to fascist and communist regimes overseas who know how to keep their people in their place and their workers in their place and then bring it back here. We know how to do all these things. We got spectacular public transit now, not just buses, personalized public transit. And you know a lot of it yourself. But what's the gap between the problems and injustices on the ground and what's on the shelf. It's us. We're not in, in the action. We're not in the civic action. I try to convey how easy it is. People check out from participating in democratic movements because they have four excuses. One is, I don't have time. The second is, I don't know how to do it. I mean, I go to these city council meetings. I, I don't know. What's this Robert Rules of Procedure? Or what? They tell me to shut up and sit down. And, or the third one is, I'm afraid. I mean, they slander you, and it's not good for my promotion and my work to be controversial. And here's the ultimate cop-out. The people have the time. 
They can learn the rules. These are people who know the most complex video game rules you can imagine. And, and, and they can be not blistered by moonbeams. I mean, this is America, after all. You know, so somebody says something bad about you, big deal. You shrug it off. You're mature. You keep your eye on the, the goal of justice that you're pursuing. So let's say you have all three. And the fourth one, this is the cop-out. Eh, if I do all this, nothing's going to happen. The big boys are going to decide, so let's just get along by going along, play by the rules, work hard, make money. Maybe you'll end up with a little yacht, good vacation, be up in the top 5% or 1%. Now, there's something about all of us that does not like bullies. Big corporations are bullies too often. They want to plan everything for us. Their nature is to be a hierarchical authoritarian power machine. Look at General Electric, Verizon, ExxonMobil, Pfizer, Kennecott Copper, and on and on. That's the way they're built. That's where their dynamism comes from. It comes from an authoritarian system where you don't have a Bill of Rights in that workplace. They can search you anytime they want. They can fire you without cause unless you have a union. They can suffocate your First Amendment rights. You can't be part of a city group or Bank of America and say, I, I, I want my First Amendment rights. He says, there's the door. There's no First Amendment rights inside that corporation. Now to keep their market share to keep their power in Washington, in Sacramento, they develop a very elaborate control strategy. It's called strategic planning. Some of you study that. But what do they strategically plan? You study they strategically plan how to expand markets, how to recruit the best people, how to deploy capital, how to control inventory. But they also strategically plan our elections, our politicians, our government. They commercialize childhood with their marketing, bypassing and undermining parental authority, selling these little kids junk food, junk drink, violent programming, and these kids are swelling into obesity and diabetes, huge epidemic. They want to strategically plan the food we eat the limits of cleaning our air and water by their lobbies. They're strategically planning our genetic inheritance. Try Monsanto and other companies who have thousands of, thousands of monopoly patents on our gene sequences, human gene sequences, and outright ownership of flora and fauna. They're planning our military budget. That's what Eisenhower warned us about, the military-industrial complex. Did you know that our military budget is one half of the federal government's operating expenditure? Doesn't count insurance, you know, social insurance, social security. But all these departments, one half, we have no major enemy in the world. Soviet Union is done. We're not worried about Moldova. Communist China, they're not interested in sending missiles. They want our industry. We have a few criminal gangs. How in the world can you sustain an $800 billion military budget, which was $300 billion 12 years ago? $300 billion. If you don't exaggerate these gangs, overreact to them, and spread them all over 25 countries. Al-Qaeda was only in Afghanistan. It's now everywhere, moving into Syria. It's in Somalia, Yemen. North Africa, Pakistan, Iraq, it's all over. That's how successful we've been. It's page one story in the New York Times today. Wow, guess this, the arms that we're facilitating going to the rebels in Syria are falling into the hands of the ra radical jihadists allied with Al-Qaeda in Syria. 
No, all that's business. More and more business. More special forces, more helicopter gunships, more aircraft carriers. It's the military industrial complex. Show me when Lockheed Martin ever says enough is enough in terms of their bombers. Show me when General Dynamics ever says enough in terms of their nuclear warhead submarines. You know, one Trident submarine with multiple warheads. Boom! 25 minutes later, how many cities are extinguished? Anybody know? 200. Anywhere in the world and we're building more. So we're not building enough good clinics, good schools, good public transit, no, no. We've militarized our foreign policy. That's where the big money and the lobbies are. We don't spend anything waging peace, maybe a few million bucks in Washington, waging war, big stuff. You know what's gonna go on tomorrow in the White House? It's called Tuesday with Barack. Barack although he may be on the hustings now, he's suspended. But what he's been doing is meeting with his national security officials. This is all reported in the New York Times, May of this year. And he is told, you decide, boss, which drone fires on what suspects, who lives, who dies. One day, the CIA didn't want to make this decision. There was a Taliban, Pakistan Taliban. Now, the Afghan Taliban's are fighting us. The Pakistan Taliban's are in this no, no man's land, but they really are focused on the regime in Pakistan. He's on the roof of his house, and his wife is rubbing his back, and he's got other members of the family. And they said, we got them in our sights. What's the decision, President? That's what he does Tuesdays. He said, push the button, vaporized. You don't think that's ever gonna come to haunt us? Are we kidding? You don't think cybersecurity is gonna come to haunt us? We're just ahead of the rest by a few years. You don't think nanotech military products are gonna come back to haunt us? If we do that to any country in the world with our drones, never mind national sovereignty, suppose there's a, a group that wants to overthrow Putin in Russia, and they're operating. You know, we have a lot of immigrant groups over our history trying to overthrow people in their ancestral land. What's going to stop Putin sending a, a drone over? He'll say, you do it. Why can't we do it? Mm -hmm.